I just want to bring this word to you today that the Lord rested upon my heart. Um, and it's about something that all of us face in life. But yet it's quite a mystery to us as humanity. Choices. Choices is a mystery of the human experience. But yet we make them every single day. And we don't fully comprehend what it is or understand how we have the free will to make choices. Throughout time, civilizations have pondered over the thought of choice. The way that's expressed itself is through mythology, through the stories of great men of old. You know, and then in civilizations like the ancient Greeks, they sat down, they debated, they pondered over the concept of what it is to have choice. Then in the medieval period, the Enlightenment, they rediscovered some of those texts and they started pondering again over these thoughts of what it is to have choice. You know, in centuries gone by, in the 1800s and 1900s, you found people debating in great halls and in great institutions like Oxford and Cambridge through philosophy about the concept of choice. And today, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, we debate day by day about what it is to choose. Sometimes we feel like when we speak about the philosophers and, you know, great voices that have spoken about this topic, we kind of think, you know, this is a bit too weighty, a bit too lofty for me. I've never really sat down and considered what it is to have free will, to have choice. But let me bring it to us in a more um, practical way. Every day we ask questions about ourselves when we make our decisions and we ask ourselves things like this. Am I a product of my environment? Am I bound by the decisions of those in the past? Am I bound by my DNA? Am I the sum total of the decisions I made in the past and can I move past them? Those are questions that we wrestle with a lot. And I find that when you see people discussing these things, wherever you find questions like this, and someone decides to make the choice to argue the perspective that, you know, we are just a product of decisions made by someone else. We're bound to our DNA. We're bound to the things that we have been raised by. There's something that I observe when people respond that rises up on the inside of us as humans. And then we say, this can't be true. This isn't my life. There's no way that the things that have been done in the past truly can bind me. I must be able to choose. I must be able to decide what my future is going to be. There's something that happens when someone tells you that you can't do something that you can't move past where you're at. And something just stirs up on us on the inside. And I know as believers, there's something that just continues to move and it's even stronger in us. There's that spiritual generator that my brother was talking about the other week. There's something that speaks on the inside of us that says, no, this is not my life. This is not all I'm going to be. There is more to me than this. There's something on the inside that craves the ability to decide the future that I'm about to walk into. What is that? Because I'm not just speaking about this instinct in believers. There's something about in, in the nature of man that makes us move like that. And it starts off in Genesis 1.26. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, and according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. That thing on the inside of us that fights for the ability to choose the life that we're going to live is that image-bearing 
idea, the image bearing nature of man. That man was made in the image of God. That when man, when God breathed into man the breath of life and it mixed with the dust and man became a living soul, that there's something special about humanity that is quite different to every other creature. If you're not convinced by that, then let me go back to the scripture and say it again. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. When Christ, when God, Christ says, let them have dominion. You see, this is a decree from God which implies that there must be a response. You see, when we debate these things and you see different people like theologians, philosophers debate the concepts and the ideas of what it is to have free choice and they, they debate whether you can or whether you can't. Let's not overcomplicate the thing. If, God's ask, if God gives a decree and allows you room to make a decision, that means that you must have choice. You must have choice. Let's not overcomplicate it. God's not trying to trick you. That is just the reality of it. There must be something of choice. But then, you know, we think about it and then you say, why would theologians, why would great thinkers try and come up with doctrines, beliefs, and ideas to teach people that you don't have choice? What is the appeal of that? It doesn't sound like something that you would try and sell. That doesn't sound like a gospel, a good news. Why would people preach that? The reason is this. The mindset appeals to those of us that have went through a lot of things in life, that have experienced a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, and we don't see a way in which we can get back up again. It appeals to us that ask the questions about our lives and, and, and think, how can I... How can I get back up again? We tell ourselves things like this. My life is too hard. The trauma that I've went through is too deep. The decisions of generations and generations is too strong. I've gone too far. It's been too long. It's cut me too deep. How, how can I move past this? How can I stand up to the weight of all of the things that have happened in my life? How can I move on? And let me encourage you with this. God, in this scripture, is speaking to us and he's saying that he created man. He fashioned man. In Genesis 2, he speaks about the way that he crafted man. Man was crafted in the hands of God. And if God, who is almighty, who holds all power in his hands, was able to delicately fashion humanity and allow them to have the space to make decisions and choices, let me tell you this. The hand of trauma, the hand of your ex, the hand of the problems that you went through, are not stronger than the hand of God. If God is able to give you the ability to choose, you can, you can tell the trauma, you can't stifle me. If God allows me to choose, then you can't talk to me and tell me that I'm down and tell me that I can't get up and tell me that this is all that I'm going to live for. You can't allow those things to try and speak and make itself big in your life and say that, you know, you went through this that was your experience. You're never going to become anything more than that. We've heard those words. We've walked through them and we've been bound by them. But the fact that God in his almighty mercy allows us to make decisions for our lives beyond where we are right now tells me that there, yet, there is yet hope. There is hope. There's hope for a decision in the future. There's hope beyond what you've went through and what you're in right now. The devil can't bind you, keep you, and muzzle you to the place where you can't move past the things that you've went through in your past. It's a lie from hell. It's a lie from the pit of hell. 
You see, the enemy tries to stifle us when we're in, in, in our situations, in our moments, when we're by ourselves, when there's no one else in the room, when you're sitting alone at home and all you have is the situation that you're going through. What the enemy tries to do is he tries to come into the situation and say, you know what, there's no one here for you. There's, there's, there's no one that's, that's encouraging you. Where's your friend? Why haven't they called you? Why haven't they texted you? you, you you've, you've went through this cycle over and over again. There hasn't been any breakthrough. Where's your God? That's what the enemy will whisper into your ears. He'll, there, he'll sit there through the situations and downtrodden periods. I remember one of the darkest points in my life. And all I really could do was sit in my room, turn off my lights, close my blinds, and just sit in the corner of my room and just be angry. I was just angry. Angry. I couldn't even get words out of my mouth. Just angry. Angry that this, that, you know, is this really my life? Just angry. But one thing that I realized, and even as we're singing the songs today, I realized that, Lord, we went through a lot together. Mm. That this is your journey. That I'm going through things with God. That even in the moment when I was sitting down there, I was sitting there like this in the fetal position. Literally, just like this. Fetal position, angry. In that moment, I couldn't see that God was with me. In that moment, I couldn't hear nothing. I couldn't see nothing because I just closed off all the blinds. I didn't want to hear, see nothing. But even in that moment, when I look back now, I know that I wasn't alone. That this was my testimony. That the Bible says that we are living epistles. That we are, the, we are what people, that, that word epistle means a letter. We are the letters you know, like the, the apostles that wrote letters to different churches that spoke to them about God, that educated them, that, in, that enlightened them about the realities of walking with Christ. You're that letter to someone. You're that letter that people are reading today. That testimony, that breaking, that molding that you went through is testifying of God to someone else. There's a reason why you went through it. And it can't hold you down. Amen. 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 And so what the devil tries to, to do is to fashion you in that moment. But you must understand that you have choice. Amen. And the first pivotal expression of our ability to choose is actually found in the book of Genesis in chapter 3. So let's go there together in chapter 3. And we're going to look at this, interestingly, from the perspective of what the serpent is saying. So we'll start off in verse 1. Okay. So the scripture says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then... Let's go to verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of your eat the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The, sa- the serpent here in this situation is trying to frame the conversation in a way. He's trying to guide the conversation. But we can see from analyzing how he's speaking to Eve, this serpent, you know, in in the Hebrew, it's Nakash, which means the shining one, has already shown that he is a fallen creature. Narratively, we are seeing from Genesis 1 that God is creating and he's framing everything by his decrees. And that everything is responding to how he is speaking and acting in order. But now we come across the first figure that is acting out of order, but knows God's decrees. And it begs us to ask the question, who is 
this serpent that acts in contradiction. The, sh- the serpent shows a keen awareness of God's word. And he, he questions Eve about that. But he responds like no other creature and acts in a way that nothing else that we've seen prior to this acts. So it stirs up an intrigue in us to say, who is this? Who is this figure? Who is this creature? Okay, we can, we can start to deduce something. We're going to investigate who this creature is. Verse 1 says, the serpent is more cunning than any beast of the field, which is the Hebrew term, which is ahrum. And it means the term is related to the idea of being shrewd, being sensible, being prudent. The scripture is trying to convey to us that this serpent has an ability or a knowledge when it comes to the future. He has a level of awareness when it comes to making steps and making plans. He's very strategic in every step that he's making. He's very strategic about how he's approaching Eve. He's very strategic about the things that he's saying in the moments that he's presenting himself. He presents himself when Eve is alone. He presents himself in a favorable spot and asks questions without revealing his intentions. He's very... He's very smart and crafty about what he's doing. But when we consider what, when we consider people who are able to understand or have a knowledge of the future, we understand that wisdom is not just born from, um, you know, just head knowledge, but wisdom is gained from experiences in life. Wise people are those that have learned from the experiences that life has taught, but we're just beginning the Bible. But his wisdom is beyond anything that we've seen before. So it makes us ask the question, what's his story? What's what's the serpent's story that has allowed him to understand and be aware of things and plan strategically? What sets him apart from the rest of creation? And then the serpent, in all of his wisdom, understood this about God's words. The serpent understood that God's words leaves room for a decision. And when God speaks and gives a word, the decision is actually an invitation. It's an invitation. But instead of, uh, because he's aware of that, how when he speaks to Eve, he speaks to her as if this invitation is actually a command from someone that's a tyrannical leader, a tyrannical despot that's trying to control, manipulate, and just, and just make sure that she doesn't have any power or autonomy. He frames it as if God's invitation is actually an invitation to prison. He reframes how she sees God's commands. He reframes the way in which she's perceiving what God initially said. That's the wisdom and the cunning of how he's strategically placing things. And he knows, and and the thing is, he's framing it in that way because he knows this, like any parent in the room will know. As soon as you ask someone not to do something, the next question is going to be, why? Why? The next question, he's so smart and strategic that he's actually started to make the wheels turn in her mind. He's actually got her to start to, to, to think about, okay, well, what is the possibilities of not following God? What's the possibilities of not listening, of not listening to God's commands? You know, church, we need to stop entertaining the devil's framing of God's reality. We need to stop entertaining the devil's words when he's saying, you know, well, if you really did that, what would really happen? You know, we have those friends, we have those people in our circle that will entice us to say, well, if you, you know, if you do that, the best decision right now is just to lie and let it go. You know what I mean? There's people in your life, listen, I know this for a fact, there's people that will say, 
Okay, yeah, let's go out. Don't tell no one. No one will find out. No one will find out. It'll be fine. Trust me, that'll be you. That'll be you that everyone finds out. There's people that literally will stand there and say, well, you know, the best decision for you right now is just, you know, you already took the step out the door. You might as well go the whole way. You know, you have those friends that egg you on, that will bring you into scenarios that could actually pull you out of your character. We need to stop entertaining those conversations. We need to stop entertaining people that are telling us and framing us that God's ways are not the right ways, that are telling us that God's just too, too controlling. Talking about God like he's a controlling partner, like he just wants or he just wants your time, he wants your attention, he just wants you, he just wants everything to, to be done in his way, in his time. That's not God. That's not God. The reality of it is that God's decisions and God's words for us are actually an invitation to a better life. The reason why God asks you to do things is not just because it's arbitrary. It's not just because, oh, you know, God's got a thing against fornication. God's just got a thing where he just gets annoyed when you lie. It's not like that. What God is trying to do is he's trying to teach you how to bring, how to clear out sin out of your life and bring in the Holy Spirit into your community, into your house, into your home. That is actually what the law is. You know, sometimes we look at the book of the law as some bit of do's and don'ts. It's, it's the thing that everyone skips when they read the Bible. They go, all right, allow it. Let's not read Leviticus because it's just a bit long. It's just a bit, you know, oh, don't do this. Do that. Don't do this. Be like that. Don't wear this. Don't eat that. That's how we view it. But we need to understand that God's words are not, ju are not just commands for the sake of command's sake God's words are invitations into his presence God's words are inviting us into relationship you have to understand that actually the sacrifices were that which was purging sin out of the camp and allowing for God to enter in the reason why they even had the day of atonement was the fact of the sins of the people raising so high that was becoming a block a block to God and his relationship with them. So what he was doing is that he was purging sin out the camp. That's the reason why the hand of the high priest was laid upon the scapegoat and sent out. The reason why that happens is because the Lord is placing the sin of the camp on the goat and sending it out to the wilderness so that it can be away from the people. The whole idea of those rituals that you see and you think, man, it's just... You know, this archaic thing is literally God symbolically and spiritually sending out evil and welcoming in good. That is why he, that's why God does these things. That's why God expects these things from us. It's not for the sake of just <laughs> doing things. But let's return to verse 4. And, he's, and this is what it says. Then the serpent said to the woman... You will not surely die, for God knows that in, that in that day you will eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, if someone comes into your life and tells you that God's ways, God's choices are actually making you worse, trust me, they're making you worse. They're making you worse. Because this line of thinking is actually connected to modern day humanism and Satanism and the occult. Because what they'll tell you is that the reason why they serve or why they, when they use the Bible and these things, they speak about the fact of God as if he's someone that is dictating and wanted to control and didn't want humanity to reach the peak of what humanity can be. That's the concept that they, they kind of see it as. They see it as, you know, God enslaving humanity. And then this thinking even stretches back even further to what the Bible calls the mother of harlots, Babylon. That's where it stretches back to. So the sin of Babylon is this. The sin of Babylon is trying to force God down instead of humanity coming back up to God. That's the sin that's the sin. Humanity needed to ascend into God's presence, not for God's presence to be forced down by the hand of man. 
Genesis 6 tells us that there is, after, after we come out of the garden, we see the, the line of Cain and we see the line of Abel. Uh, well, that got cut off short, but <laughs> the, line, the lines of Seth. So we, we see the, these lines that come afterwards. And it culminates with Cain with this in Genesis 6. And it tells us that there was an unrighteous relationship between the divine and humanity. And it formed what the Bible calls Nephilim, which is fallen ones. Again, this speak of fallenness, fallen behaviors, fallen people, fallen ideas. This was a rejection of the Most High God. That's how God saw it in Genesis 6, verse 3. He saw it as a rejection of himself. He saw it as something that was a complete, not an offense towards humanity, but offense directly towards him saying, I don't want you in my space. I don't want you in, in my reality. So I'm going to do it on my terms. That's how God saw this. So because of this, God cleansed the world for a flood and cleansed out the unrighteousness. And then after this, we have the Tower of Babel. You think that after that situation, you're like, come on, people, come on. We've already made the mistake once. Let, let's kind of learn. Let's, let's move on from the, from the mistakes of the past. No, what did they decide to do? We decide to build a tower. We decide to build a tower. After all of that, after all the things that we went through, there's a literal flood that clears off all the sin from, from, from the passage. It wiped out and said, okay, I'm just going to cut that all off. And yet we go back to the same old places as if we're bound to those choices. But the devil is a liar. So, so they build the tower and the Lord is not pleased. Humanity tries to go back up again, lusting after this unholy relationship with the angels, the sons of God. This unholy union, they want it again. And the book of Deuteronomy actually gives us a commentary on God's response to it. We know that God um, said, let me just disband them into different nations. But the book of Deuteronomy actually gives us a, a deeper insight into what God was doing and his intent behind what he did. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 7 to 9. Um, and I'm going to read it in the ESV. So it says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you. Your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. As a result of what happened, the Lord actually appoints the nations to, as he says, the sons of God. We'll discover more about what it means by the sons of God. And what that is, is that he actually creates a separation between himself and humanity. Because like we said before, what happens when we fall into sin is that it creates separation. So instead of God directly handling the humanity, he sets over them sons of God to be a principality over those people that then listen up to God. That is the way that God operates when we distance him, when we make decisions away from him. He actually distances himself from us. So that's exactly what he did in Genesis 3.22, which is the culmination of that story with Adam and Eve. It says, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. This is after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. He said, and now let us, let, lest he put out his hand and take us also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and he placed cherubim 
at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So God creates a separation between us and him. That is the, what happens after we move away from him. And then it begins what is now a series of decisions, choices, and stories that we begin to read about in the scriptures. It begins the narrative of what is Christianity. And the best way that we can understand this narrative and this story, I believe, is through the life and experiences of the leaders of Israel. So, amazing, so we're going to look at two key people here. We're going to look at King Saul and King David. These are the first two kings of Israel that, got, that we have. They make choices against God, but they have radically different outcomes. Let's start off with Saul. Saul, in, some, in 1 Samuel 15 and 16, the Lord God says to Saul, he says, Saul, and this is another thing that I think would be amazing if you know, we looked into a little bit more. What was started in Joshua wasn't completed. In Joshua, what was happening was that God was waging war on certain peoples and nations because of the idolatry in which they live by. But it wasn't yet completed in Joshua. So it continues to the judges and it continues on to King Saul. So King Saul gets this command from the Lord and the Lord goes, okay, I want you to go now and take out these people, the Amalekites. And I want you to cut off King Agag. I want you to utterly destroy the whole nation, gone. Everything, gone. Nothing left, gone. Done. And Saul goes about, he goes to war, he does his thing, he wins. As the scripture speaks about Saul, Saul's this big, tough guy that everyone looks at and he's like, yeah, he's, he's the guy, he's the man. He stands strong, he looks good. He's, he's, he's that guy. He's that guy. So, Saul goes out, Saul goes and fights, and after he fights, he, comes, he, he wins the battle, but he decides afterwards, he says to the people, you know what, these livestock look good, you know, these livestock look good, and they're going to make me a lot of money, you know, all right, so you save all of them, all the good ones, you save that, and King Agag, you know, he might come in useful later on, he might come in a bit handy later on. So you just, you just save him, you save him. Now, Saul in his pride and pomp decides to make this decision against what God has decided for him to do. And at this time, there is a, a, a man of God, a man of God that is seeing. And, you know, we're blessed to know what that looks like. <laughs> we're blessed to know what that looks like. But this man of God, Samuel, is unique is unique in the, way that, in the way that God spoke to him, was speaking to him, and where he started at. So Samuel gets a word from the Lord about what he did. And the Lord, and, and Samuel understands, yes, Sam, <laughs> he understands. Samuel understands, um, he hears from the Lord, and then the Lord tells him, I am grieved that I made the decision to make Saul king. I'm grieved of that decision. The Lord is upset with what Saul has done. He's like, nah, it, the Lord is, and the Lord says, I have actually rejected Saul for the decision that he's made. And then Samuel comes down and, and shares the news with Saul. This is what Samuel says. Then Samuel went to Saul and said to him, blessed, uh, went Saul and, went to Saul, and Saul said to him, blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So Saul has the absolute goal to walk up in the man of God's face, walk up to Samuel and be like, I did it. <laughs> walk up to Samuel and say, I, I did it. I did what God said I should do. He bold-faced lied in the face of the prophet of God. 
bold faced lad. And the thing is, Samuel is one of the Samuel's one of the baddest prophets in the Bible, you know. I love reading about Samuel. Because this is how Samuel responds. This is what he goes, he goes, he goes, I can hear something in the background. He said, I can I can hear something. It sounds like the bleating of of sheep. What's that? What's that? Baddest. Baddest. <laughs> We're not even responding. He's just like, what's that? What's that? Saul's not giving this up. Saul's continuing with the story, you know. Saul's continuing. And then when, when he clocks the fact that Samuel knows, he goes, all right. But it's the people that did it. The people wanted them. The people wanted the livestock, you know. It's the people. It's them people, you know. It's them people that you gave me. It's them you know, the, one of the weakest things you can do as a leader is not take responsibility for those that are underneath you. To shout in the face of those that, are respons- that you're responsible for and blame them, that is a sign of pure weakness. As a leader, we take responsibility for the decisions of those that are underneath us. And even when someone makes a mistake, you know what the Bible says? about those that make a mistake. He says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Our responsibility as leaders is not to shout and put down those who make mistakes. It's to think, how can I pick them back up again? How can I make sure that this don't happen to you again? I've seen you go through this cycle over and over again. I've seen you back here over and over again. Praying about the same problems, praying about the same needs. How can I pick you back up from where you come from? How can I make sure that your life looks different from now? That's our responsibility. Not to look down and shame. Look down on them and say, it's, it's them people, you know. You know what I mean? It's, it's, that, it's that trying to look like as if, ugh, it's them. It's them. That's not, that's not the way of Christ. That's not the way of Christ. So he does that, and then he goes back, and he, he, he's still going, you know, and he says, he claims, I did the right thing. I went, and I, you know, I got them, and I'm going to sacrifice them, though. I'm going to make sure I sacrifice them. I'm going to do it. And then this is the thing. This is one of the most, Samuel's the baddest. <laughs> Samuel gives one of the most iconic lines that, there's, that we know in the scripture, That we speak about all the time when we talk about worship. And it's this line, obedience is better than. Amen. We know it. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Just shut the guy up straight. One word answer, just like, done. A few little lines, done. Just be quiet. (laughs) And then Samuel tells Saul that God has rejected him as king. This is so, you know, I'm just going to continue about Samuel being the baddest because I just feel like that today. Let me just, let me just preach on that. <laughs> you know what, Samuel, I need, a demonst- I need a demonstration, to be fair. I need a demonstration. So after this, Saul, Saul, like, Saul's like, wow, God's serious about what, what he's doing. So Saul's like, let me, save, let me save face, you know. Let me make sure my reputation don't look too bad. So Samuel, can you go down with me and let's do a sacrifice together? Samuel's like, nah, nah, it's not happening. It's not happening. So Samuel begins to walk off. Samuel begins to walk off. This is what, this is what Saul does. Saul's like, you know, one of those child when you tell them, you know, you can't have this. No, 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 please, please, please. And he rips, he rips, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) He rips off, he rips, he rips it, he rips it off. You know, it's ripped, it's ripped, it's ripped, it's ripped, it's ripped, it's ripped. 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 He rips it off. And Samuel turns around to him and says, just as you have ripped my cloak today, today, The kingdom has been rent from you. Rent from you. That Samuel moved different. Different. All right, Samuel, thank you. (laughs) Move different. 
Now, the thing is, Saul believed that his way of operating before God was the right way. Saul, in his own pump, decided that his idea of how life should be lived was better than God's. Saul was doing exactly what the devil told Adam, or Eve to do. He was operating in the same type of spirit. And what happens to Saul afterwards? Saul gets demonized. Saul finds himself with a spirit that won't come off him only when David is playing. What he, the spirit that he began to operate in didn't leave him. It stayed with him because he decided that his ways was better than God's. So he followed after like Jesus says about the Pharisees, your father, the devil. He moved under that spirit and so it stayed with him. And you know, but yet he was still king. And I heard this from a preacher and it sat with me so strong. God is the only boss that will have you working for him and fire you. He's the only boss that will do that. You know what, saints? The people that you need to fear in your life are the friends that you have in church that move mad and don't feel any conviction. Listen, that right there tells me something. That the spirit that you're operating in, the spirit that you have accepted over your life, the spirit for which you're moving day by day. Listen, the Bible says many, many on that day will say, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do all these things, preach in your name? But he said, depart from me, I know you not. You worker of iniquity. You need to watch out for those. Because that, what that tells me is that your heart is cold. Listen, saints. When you, oh, when you make mistakes, listen. When you have those friends that will over and over again walk like that, distance them. Cut off communication. You don't want that spirit, that idea, that principality to be reigning in your space. Don't welcome it in your home. Don't welcome it amongst your friends. These are the same people that I love to sit down and gossip to, you know. These are the same people that sit down there, you know. You know what, you know what Sister So-and-so did the other day? You know, rah, I, I, saw, I saw a video from her, you know. I saw it, I saw it, Insta. You know what, you want me to send it to you? Yeah, 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 here you go. We all know those people. Those are the ones that you need to stay away from. Cut off those communications. Cut off those uh, uh, alignments that you've formed, those unholy alignments. Because what Saul did when he disobeyed and continued to press, continued to press and, and tried to say that his way was the right way, is that he welcomed a demonic spirit into his environment. And he cut off the very inheritance that his children were going to receive. Then we have David. <laughs> David, David, that guy, that guy. The one that no one really respected like that. The one that was just sat out in the field, just like, you know, just go about your business, go over there. It's all right, just do, do you over there. We're gonna actually do like real stuff and fight. You just go over there and tend to sheep, yeah? All right, cool. You do you, David. But David is the man that Samuel, I said the baddest, actually turned over and didn't consider. How did he not see him? So, uh, David is the one that was just not considered by anybody. Just, 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 that, just who's David? All right, David. All right, cool. But David is God's choice. David is the one that God chooses to reign over Israel. But yet David still has his problems. David, one night, he decides not to go to battle. He decides to just, let me just, let me just, let me go back on the step. Let me just catch at home. Let me just wait at home. I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait at home. 
He's like, all right, let me go for a walk. Let me go for a walk. He went for a walk, and he saw something. Oh, he saw something. <laughs> what do you mean, what did he see? <laughs> listen, listen. You got to remember where we are, you know. <laughs> what did he see? Read your Bible. <laughs> Read your Bible. All right. And he sees this sight, of this, 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 this frame. He sees, yeah. <laughs> he sees the, he, he sees he sees you know he sees the bible says he's a prophet <laughs> you know bless bless king david bless king david so he sees he sees something that he wants and he sees and then he finds out this is someone's wife what does David decide to do? He's like, no, I, I, I still want that. I, 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 I still want this woman. I still want her. So he, you know, sleeps with her. And then he gets her pregnant. And then if he didn't just, he didn't just get her pregnant, he, he, he's just like, you know, Ra, this is bad, you know. Okay, how can I cover the thing? Yo, call, call, call your husband back. Call your husband back. He's fighting where he's supposed to be. And he's at home, chilling, after making his wife pregnant. And he calls him home and he says, you know what, just stay with your wife a little bit. He's like, stay with your wife, you know. Stay with her. She misses you. She misses you, you know. Stay with her. Yeah. You know, just be nice to her, be kind to her, treat her good, and then go about your business. This holy man of God, this warrior decides, no, my brothers are on the battlefield. I can't, be, I can't be doing that. So then David decides in the most cowardly way possible to go, I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to do it in the most cowardly way. Let me just say to my commander, yo, send him to the hottest point of the battle. Make sure he's right there in the thick of it. Make sure that there's no chance that he's coming back. Just front line. Everyone else, front line. Front line. Just, just, just st standing right there. All right. And then, he, and then he killed, and then, you know, Uriah is killed. And this, this, this thing that, you know, David does is, you know, it, it, he does that. And you know he repents, but we'll get to that. But this, this lust problem doesn't quite leave David, you know. If you continue to read in the scriptures, this thing always gets me. I'm not sure if any, I think Israel knows where I'm going to. That in his old age, the Bible says that the way that they made sure whether David was alive or not, was that he was like, yo, Send in a damsel just to check if it's still working. That's how David's life, that's how David is still moving. That's David at the end of his life. The end of his life. The, the way that they're checking whether he's still, he's still alive. That's, it's, it, you know what's mad about that? I know all of you are laughing now. <laughs> I've, I've taken you all out with that one. He's moving like that to the point where the only way, the only way that you can check on his existence is through his problem. That's the definition of, his, of, of how you check whether he's still functioning, is whether he's still operating under that problem. That struggle. That's the only way. He's been identified by his struggle. That's deep. But yet, hundreds of years later, the writer Luke writes about David and Saul and says this in Acts 13, verse 22. It says, 
After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. How can a man that has been walking like that be called a man after God's own heart? It just don't sound right, does it? It really don't sound right. What is it that separates Saul, rejected, rejected by God, and David, accepted? This is the difference, saints. Saul decided that his ways were the best ways. But a prophet, Nathan, came up, and I believe he was operating in a similar mantle to Samuel. And, you know, when Samuel did, you know, was moving, moving, it was like, you know, I, I hear something in the background. Nathan took a different approach, and he gave him a story. He gave David a story. And he said, he, he gave him a story about, you know, someone having a few, you know, loads of things. And someone has one precious thing to them. And the person with absolutely lots decides to take from the person that has the one precious thing in their life. You know what David did? David turned around and said, that man deserves to be put to death. David said, that man deserves to die now. Who is he? Where is he? Let me do it myself. Let me come and take my sword and decapitate him right now. Nathan goes, that's you? That's you? The difference between Saul and David is that when Saul heard Samuel, Saul said, but it's them. David said, but it's me. I'm the problem. I'm the one that made the decision. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I know that my ways are not the right ways. Saul said, I know, I know my ways are right. I'm going to sacrifice to you. David said, Lord, I'm broken. David writes the psalm and he says, Lord, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. David says, Lord, I'm wrong. I'm broken. I'm burst down. I'm beat up. I'm not the person that I'm supposed to be. I know that I've fallen short from you. David writes one of the psalms that many of us pray when we've made a decision in our life that is against God. He writes Psalms 51. He talks like, wash me, O Lord. Cleanse me from my iniquity. He says, Lord, I'm wrong. Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm bruised. The reason why is because God is not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to agree with him. He's not asking you to make the right decision every single day. He's not saying that. He says, you know what? I know you are broken. I know that you, in your own strength, let me get that right, in your own strength, he's not asking you to make the right decision. But in his grace, he says, in your weakness, in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your downtroddenness, in what you see to yourself as a broken, shattered pot of clay. He says, listen, put yourself back on the potter's wheel. I'm going to fix you up back again. He says, I just want you to agree with me that what you did was wrong. I just want you to agree with me that the way that you're living life, the decisions that you're making in your own strength ain't the right one. I don't want you to be like the devil and turn around and say, well, if you do it, you're going to become even better than God. And if you do it, you're going to be like this. It, it, that's what God's not asking for. The God, uh, the God we serve is asking us, will you agree? Will you decide to agree? Will you allow grace to work on the inside of you? Because the thing is, we're weak. We don't have it in our own strength. That is why he sent his Holy Spirit. Even before, you know, when David was praying that prayer, 
The Holy Spirit wasn't indwelling people. It was just hovering over people. He didn't have the relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit today. But yet he saw it so pivotal and he said, no, don't take it away from me. We have something hidden on the inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit that is able to carry us through. The Bible calls him the helper. He calls him the helper. We have help, saints. We have help. Turn to someone and say, you have help. You have help. You have help. You know what, saints? We need to stop being Pharisees to ourselves. Some of us, we stand in the mirror and say, you know what? You're not going to, you ain't no good, you know. You keep on making that decision, you know. You, you, You keep on going back to the same ways. You know what it is? You know what it is? The Bible, is, the, the Bible doesn't teach us to be extremely overcritical. The Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible shows us the reality of our brokenness and asks us, are you going to try and decide to live a different way? It's not, it's not about us standing there and, and sitting there and, and, and thinking that we're, we're, you know, like the Pharisees, performing performing, performing, performing holiness, putting on the right clothes, putting on the right situations, attending church on a Sunday, attending church, you know, attending church events, serving in this team, doing this for that team. God's not interested in our performance. You know what the reality is, saints? If you come on a Sunday and one day put on a performance and like, yeah, you know, I'm this person, and six days of the week, you're living like God knows what. You wouldn't even be able to recognize you. You know, you're not the person on Sunday. You're the person Monday to Saturday. God is not interested in your performances. God's not interested in us playing games, putting on ideas, putting on these acts and saying, you know, God, I'm just going to pretend that, you know, I'm, I'm living this way. God wants us to be real with him, you know. God would rather you to be real with him with the one day that you're giving him and say, Lord God, I'm struggling Monday to Saturday, you know, but I'm trying. God would rather you say that because what that tells God is that there is hope. There's a chance because you agree. What that tells God is that I, this one I can work with. That's what, God's, that's what God wants from us. God wants us to decide I've decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the will uh, we, we can continue this understanding of you know being tempted and making choices with Jesus and I'm, I'm going to be quick I'm surprised that I've actually gone so long Lord <laughs> but I'll be quick um, Jesus Jesus finds himself in the wilderness of Judea. And what we can see from this is, this is again Adam meeting the serpent. Okay. This is the second Adam. That's what the scriptures speaks about, him as the second Adam. Through biblical tradition, we understand the serpent to be Satan. Thousands of years have passed by from the time that that. The garden has happened, but Satan is still about doing the same thing, the same thing. You know, after losing so much, you would try and think, why has this guy not switched sides? He loses when it comes to tempting Jesus, and then he loses ultimately when Jesus dies on the cross. But yet, the guy is still doing the same thing today. Why? 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 We understand about Satan is that Satan could actually be found in the, the council of heaven. We read that in the book of Job. We understand that, that when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord, that Satan was also present. That helps us understand why Satan was in the garden. The reason why Satan was in the garden is because the garden was a meeting place for the council of heaven. That's what the garden was. 
So let's understand this, saints. Just because it's divine doesn't mean it's anything that we're supposed to be listening to. There's many spirits, as the scripture says, that have gone out into the world. Just because it sounds divine, so just because it sounds heavenly, doesn't mean that we should be listening to it. We shouldn't. We should test the word. So uh, let's go back to Genesis 3.22 to understand why does Satan not change his tune? This is why it says, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now let him put out his hand and take, uh, and lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. There's something there that is a, a, a teller there. When it says live forever, there's a aspect of the divine or the sons of God that is fixed here that we can observe. There's something about them that they're fixed in their opinion and in their way of thinking. All right, I'll leave that there because I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go through this quickly. We know the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm not going to paint the picture. I just want to say this. Jesus is facing his hardest moment. He finds himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is... He brings his inner circle with him. And the Bible says in Mark that he falls. He falls to pray. And the Bible says that he prays so hard that his sweat turned to blood. These prayers that he was praying were so heavy and deep that his sweat was turned into blood. And we're privileged to be able to see because he prayed. And, and, and you know, we're privileged to be able to see the prayers that he prayed throughout the scriptures. And it's interesting that in his hardest moment, he was praying and we can see those prayers today. What's interesting is that today in, you know, charismatic churches, in Pentecostalism, when we face hard times, our prayers can't be read. Because our first instinct is to go to tongues. When Jesus prayed his hardest prayers, that his sweat turned to blood, he prayed in a known tongue. When we pray and we're going through hard times, why can't we speak English? You know, what the re you know why we do that, saints? I'm going to be real with you. We want to turn to mysteries to evade our problems in reality. We'll sit there and, and go to tongues because we don't want to face the reality of the problem we're facing. We don't want to sit there and look at the problems that are staring us in the face. We just want to close our eyes and go somewhere else. When Jesus said, I, Jesus turned and said, Lord, I don't want this to, I'm struggling, but not my will, thy will be done. He said that in his understanding. He prayed in his understanding that I'm going to sacrifice my life. In his understanding, he laid down his ability to choose and, and said, Lord, I give it over to you. What we do sometimes is that we go there and we go, God, no, I, this, this is too hard for me. T take it away. Take it away. So let me, just, let me just escape into mystery. Church, come back to reality. Let's start to face our problems and start to say, Lord, I laid down my life. Lord, this is hard. This is a tough season. But Lord God, in my understanding, in the full faculty of my thinking, in the full capacity of my will, I decide, Lord, I'll go with you. There's, there's a song that I, I just love that it says, I shall have the Savior with me, for I dare not walk alone. I dare not walk alone. I shall keep his presence with me. And you know, Aaron, I'll get you to sing it, but <laughs> it's a hymn. It's a hymn. And then it goes, then my soul shall fear 
no end. For there he leads me, where he will. I will go without a murmur. I will go. I'll go without a murmur, Lord. I'll go. I'll lay it down. I'll lay it down. Jesus was wrestling with the destiny of his assignment. Jesus was wrestling with the fact of, you know, you know, in, in every natural human, just it bypasses even our brain. Like when you fall over, you immediately put your hand out because your nervous system is wired to defend yourself, to protect yourself. Jesus had to fight every natural instinct inside of him to say, preserve your life. The life that Jesus was preserving to preach the gospel, he let, had to lay down to be the gospel. He had to pivot so hard in the Garden of Gethsemane from what he was doing before to something completely like the scripture says, the scripture says like a sheep. Uh, I'm going to read a few of them about how the, the scripture speaks about this great gospel truth. It says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. It says in Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He went from preaching loud to just being dumb before the people that ridiculed and mocked him. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And you ask ourselves the question, why? And 2 Corinthians 5.15 gives us this answer. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and them and rose again. Now, in the last minutes that I have, this is actually the key text that the Lord relayed to me. It's in Ephesians 4. And let's just go there quickly in Ephesians 4. And I'm just going to spin there really quickly. Ephesians 4. And then we're going to start off at verse 11. So you can follow me on your Androids if you have them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There's liberty in the house today. There's liberty. <laughs> all right, all right. We've got a few minutes left. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come to the unity. This word unity is speaking about oneness. It's speaking about us being in agreement. Remember what I said before, what God is looking for in us is what? Agreement. Agreement. And then it says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. This word knowledge is a word that I love so much. It, it's, 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 um, to, but let's go past that and let's go to this word. So it goes to, and the, the, for, the fullness of man. This word is teleos. This, this perfect man, it's teleos. What, that's, what that word actually means is it's speaking about the end desire or outcome that God has for man. And this is where the crux is for the text today. And I'm going to speed through this very quickly, but I want you to follow this perfectly. Unto a perfect man, unto the teleos of man. Okay. This will be something that you'll have to study in your own time. But let me say it like this. Revelation 12 verse 4 says, 
it tells us that a third of heaven laid down their crowns to rebel against heaven. That's what Revelation 12, 4 says. The Bible in Genesis 10 gives us that there are 72 nations. Depending on which version you read, but anyway. 72 nations, you can study that. 72 nations. We read Deuteronomy 32, where, where God gives us the narrative of the Tower of Babel. And in that, God tells us that God set over the nations angels, sons of God, to rule over the nations. Revelation 4.10 tells us that 24 elders laid down their crown in service to God. If anyone did the quick maths, 24 is a third of 72. Now let me lay it out even easier. The sons of God were set over nations to rule. Those, a third of them, which you can, again, the 72 nations, fell away. Now, 24 step up in their place. The teleos, the perfect man that God is pointing us to, is that you know why the devil was, you know the history that we're trying to understand about the devil. The devil saw that that thing that God was fashioning in his hand was that what was that was that what was coming to replace him. What the teleos, what the perfect man is, is that God is, was looking and is looking in us for men and women that are willing to lay down their lives and as the scripture says, don't love their lives too much that they weren't able to, to, to give it up. To stand up in the place of those who turn their back to God and restore the order that is in heaven. What the Lord is calling for in this scripture when it's speaking about why Christ died for us is this. Christ died so that we could go back to the garden again. Christ died so that we could go back to the garden and make a different decision. Christ died because everyone's going to live eternally, but not everyone's going to live eternally in, in heaven. The reason why he did that is because the devil, the, the, the tree of life that God moved away, everyone's going to partake of in that judgment day. We shall all live and have eternal life. Will it be eternal damnation or walking with Christ? The reason why this word has come to us today is because God is speaking to us. And he gave me this scripture to say this. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you. That I have set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life life there is a choice that is set before us choose life that both you and your descendants may live where Saul decided and chose death and walking after Satan and cut off his lineage where the devil thought he had won and caused Adam to be cut off from the garden Jesus came again. We're going into that Easter period. Jesus came again so that you could have a second chance to choose. I want you to know that I've, pre I've preached a lot today about choosing. And it may be a hard word to hear. It may be a hard word to hear. But I want you to remember this, what I said about David. It wasn't the fact that he made the mistake. It was the fact 
that he agreed and chose to walk after God. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. You know, we've made many choices. We've lived through many experiences, through traumas, through hard times, through, through a lot of things that we went through, dark times, I know. We sat through very tough places, very tough seasons. But God is trying to speak to us and say, there's a choice. There's a choice that's set before us.